Hey everyone, my name is Nikki Young and this is Serial Mapper, an international true crime podcast. I'm back with another true crime story to lull you to sleep or perhaps to give you nightmares. Tonight's case is technically a solved one, but new DNA evidence could blow the whole thing open again. Mother of three, Darlie Routier, would call 911 in the early morning hours of June 6, 1996, to report that an intruder had stabbed her two young sons to death in her home. Darlie had also been stabbed, but she would recover from her injuries. Her two boys, unfortunately, wouldn't make it. Her behavior after her boys were laid to rest made many people wonder if she was really the grieving mother that she was supposed to be. After the crime scene was processed, the witnesses interviewed, and the evidence collected, everything pointed in one direction. Darlie Routier was not another victim in the attack in her home. She was the perpetrator, according to investigators. She would be arrested for the murders of her sons, found guilty, and sentenced to death. She still sits on death row to this day, and she's never wavered in maintaining her innocence. There are many people who believe that she is an innocent woman. But what does the DNA say? We're going to walk through the story, the timeline, evidence, trial, and where things stand right now. Let's jump in. Darlie was a beautiful, popular cheerleader who was born on January 4th, 1970 in Altoona, Pennsylvania. While she always appeared as a ray of sunshine to those who knew her, her life was anything but. As the eldest child in the family, she held a sense of responsibility for ensuring that her siblings were well taken care of. When she was just seven years old, her parents would divorce and she would have to keep it together, be a big girl and a role model to her little sisters. Her mother would remarry less than a year later and move the family to Texas for a fresh start. This marriage would also fail, with Darlie's mother and stepfather having explosive, violent fights every night of the week. They would move into their own modest family home, just Darlie, her mom, and her little sisters. When Darlie grew up, she blossomed into this conventionally attractive young woman who was popular in school and boys were really drawn to. She started dating a young man named Darren Routier in her young teen years. Darren worked as a busboy at a local restaurant that Darlie's mother also worked at. Darren had big plans for his future, and Darlie's mother thought that it would be a good match for her daughter. She set the pair up, and it was basically love at first sight, with them becoming childhood sweethearts who would take the next step and get married at just 18 years old. They would honeymoon in Jamaica, and I'm thinking to myself, who has money to honeymoon in Jamaica at 18 years old? But that's fine. It was considered the American dream at the time. The pair looked beautiful together, with Darlie and her bright blonde hair, and Darren with his dark wavy locks. He was two years older than she was, and the relationship started off really positive, It wasn't long after Darlie and Darren got married before she became pregnant with their first child, Devin. They looked like the perfect little family, and their finances were also about to take off. They were about to hit it big. They moved into a small home in Rowlett, Texas, where Darren started his own home-based business testing circuit boards. It was more than enough to pay the majority of the bills, and life was really looking up for the couple, especially after Darlie would give birth to their second son, Damon. They had two healthy and happy little boys and a business that became almost an overnight success. It was so profitable that Darren decided to move out of the family home and buy space in an upscale office building. The Routiers also had a home custom built in a beautiful upper class neighborhood that they made their own. In the driveway, they parked a Jaguar that sat right outside of a large, beautiful stone fountain. They lived a lavish lifestyle in the early 90s, one that many of their friends and family were really jealous about. And Darlie, well, she really embraced her role as a mother. Every holiday was cause for a huge celebration. Their home would always be the most decorated one on the street. 
Their parties would always be the biggest and most fun. The boys had everything that they could ever want or need, and Darlie was really present. She played with her kids. She got on the floor. She made every day an adventure. Everyone who knew her would say that she was a nurturing, doting mother. But beneath the surface, Darlie felt anything but great. She was very insecure, and she lacked self-esteem. She wanted to present a certain image, with the bright blonde hair and the large fake boobs, so she got a boob job, of course. Absolutely no hate from me here. I fully support anyone's decision to change their looks if it's something that's going to make them feel better. She wanted to draw attention to herself in any way that she could. So, of course, she opted for one of the largest breast implant sizes possible. With all of these physical changes came a new sense of confidence for Darlie. She noticed that she was getting more attention than she was before, and she really liked it. She liked getting compliments. She liked having men look at her. Her husband didn't like it, and it would cause a ton of arguments between the pair. There would be a huge problem with jealousy and allegations of cheating. They would be at parties with friends, and there would be violent, drunken fights between Darlie and her husband, Darren. Sadly, their two young sons would witness everything. When Darlie became pregnant with their third and youngest son, Drake, the marriage was beginning to fall apart. The family finances were also beginning to fall apart as they had spent far too much money on lavish expenses and Darren's company was going bankrupt. They weren't even generating enough money for Darren to pay himself an income. The creditors were calling and they weren't even able to qualify for a $5,000 pay loan to have the creditors buzz off. Things were really bad. Darlie went into a deep depression. We know this because she kept a diary where she would write down all of her thoughts, feelings, and suicidal ideations. On May 3rd, 1996, she wrote the following. Devin, Damon, and Drake, I hope you will forgive me for what I'm about to do. My life has been such a hard fight for a long time, and I just can't find the strength to keep fighting anymore. I love you three more than anything else in this world, and I want all three of you to be healthy and happy, and I don't want you to see a miserable person every time you look at me. Darren was aware of Darlie's depression and suicidal thoughts. The pair had talked at lengths about it. Darren tried to support his wife the best that he knew how, but he was also beginning to crumble. The couple took on each day as it came to them. And then one day, it all went to hell. Thank <laughs> you. 
Besides you and your children? No, 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 who was just six years old, Damon, who was only five, would be found dead in the utility room of the family home from an apparent knife attack. That was the recorded audio from the 911 call with Darley, who phoned the emergency line after apparently being attacked in the middle of the night. On the call, she says that she was sleeping downstairs with her two boys when a man came into the home and began to stab them. She was woken up by the attack and immediately began fighting the man and chased him through the home. She claimed he ran out through the garage, throwing the knife on the ground as he left. She would find her two young sons bleeding from their injuries on the floor of the utility room. Darley screamed for her husband Darren to come downstairs and she dialed 911. The local police arrived at the home to find one of the bloodiest crime scenes that they had ever witnessed. All around the kitchen and on the furniture was covered in blood. Whatever had happened was vicious. By the time paramedics arrived, Devin was already deceased. Damon was pronounced dead at the hospital. Darley would be treated for her wounds as well, which included a slash across her throat, bruising all over her arms leading up to her armpits, bruising on her wrists and hands, as well as cuts in her mouth. While she recovered in the hospital, police processed the crime scene. They would find a bloody knife on the utility room floor, which apparently had been used in the attack. One of the windows was broken, with the mesh window screen appearing to be slashed in a T pattern. It may have been cut by the intruder to enter the home. 
There was a broken wine glass on the kitchen floor, and the vacuum cleaner was left unraveled near the sink. It looked like someone had tried to suck the glass up with the vacuum, but just didn't get around to it. There was blood everywhere in the kitchen, and it appeared that someone had tried to clean up in the sink. Approximately 57 yards away from the home, investigators located a sock that belonged to Darley's husband, Darren. It had blood drops on it, blood that would later be identified as belonging to Devin and Damon. What did the socks have to do with the killings, and how the hell did it get down by the road? It's an unusual piece of evidence. Two days after the boys were murdered, Darley would be released from the hospital, and she would have a funeral for her sons. Friends and family, as well as the community, were terrified that there was a child killer on the loose. Darren, Darley, and baby Drake, who had survived the whole ordeal completely unscathed, decided to stay with Darley's mother. The family home on Eagleson was released by the investigators. They were done collecting evidence, but until the perpetrator was caught, no one wanted to live in the home with all of those painful images that just couldn't be shaken. Most people rallied behind Darley, supporting her through her tragedy. But she would do something that would shake a lot of heads and change a lot of minds about her. About a week after the murders, it was supposed to be a special day, Devin's seventh birthday. Darley decided to have a ceremony and then a small birthday celebration at the gravesite of her deceased son. There was a group of a few friends and family members who gathered with balloons and silly string. The media had even decided to show up and film some of the footage. When it aired, people were floored. The short clip showed Darley smiling, laughing, chewing gum, and spraying silly string on Devin's grave. To most people, she looked anything but a grieving mother. It made them suspicious that maybe she had been involved with her children's death. She didn't appear to be a mother in mourning, more like a mother who was celebrating, and it rubbed people the wrong way. Those who still to this day support Darley push back against that clip at the gravesite that day. They say that there was actually a longer, more quiet, and more mournful ceremony that was held right before Darley was filmed spraying that silly string. So do with that information what you will. Darley would basically push back at the haters, saying that before he died, her son wanted this big birthday party, and she was going to give it to him. It wasn't only the community who was now starting to see Darley in a different light. Further into their investigation, the police were beginning to believe that there was never an intruder at all. Things were starting to point to one specific theory, that Darley had killed her two children and then staged the crime scene. Four days after that controversial gravesite birthday party, the police arrested Darley for the murder of her two children, Devin and Damon. Now they just had to build a case strong enough to prove it. According to Darley's witness statement, on the night of the attack, Devin and Damon wanted to set up blanket forts and have a sleepover downstairs. Darley decided that she would join them, while Darren slept upstairs in their master bedroom and baby Drake slept upstairs in his crib. Darley and the two boys decided to put on a movie, and they wound up falling asleep together on the couch. She woke up to hear one of the little boys screaming her name, and she said she saw a man who was wearing a baseball cap walk into their utility room. She didn't know what was going on, but she felt this sense of panic, so she got up and she chased the man who fled through the garage. When she got to the utility room, she flicked on the lights and saw her two little boys on the floor bleeding with the knife lying beside them. She screamed, she picked up the knife, put it on the counter, only then realizing that she was also injured, a gash to her throat being the biggest injury that she suffered. She screamed for her husband who was upstairs and she called 911. This in itself is kind of a strange story. She was sleeping with her two children, a five-year-old and a six-year-old, and she didn't wake up from them being attacked or from herself being attacked. She only woke up after the fact. 
According to her story, the perpetrator had time to stab her and then stab her two children before she woke up. But of course, this could all be because her memory was foggy or hazy. I mean, she had been sleeping and it was early. Maybe some of the details are just kind of fuzzy. There was also no evidence of an intruder pretty much anywhere besides that mesh window screen that had been cut, but police had a theory about that as well. They believed that after Darlie killed her two kids, she staged the scene, including cutting the mesh screen herself with a knife that she had from her own knife block. They would test all of the knives that were in her home, and they would find a substance on one of the blades that they say matched the same material as the window screen, suggesting that she cut the screen herself. The defense team would say that this was absolutely junk science, but do with that what you will. Darley had also claimed that the intruder fled through the garage, but with such a vicious, violent, and bloody attack, the killer would have been covered in blood, and there were no blood drops found anywhere through the house leading to the garage or on the garage floor. As for Darley's injuries, which she says she received in the attack, the police believed that they were actually superficial. Darley had done it to herself to back up her story, slicing her own neck just enough to bleed, but not enough to kill herself. Darley would also have two drops of blood on the back of her shirt, which would match the DNA of her two boys. The prosecution would say that this was blood spatter from stabbing her boys, that it was cast off of the knife and landed on the back of her shirt. And what about that sock? How did it get so far from the home and why did it have blood from Devin and Damon on it? The police believed that Darley had planted it there to make it look like the intruder had maybe dropped it while they were running away. I'm not so sure I agree with that. In any case, I have no idea why the father's sock with the blood drops on it would be found there. It doesn't make much sense. Darley's trial would begin in January of 1997. It was an absolute media circus. Picture it, this beautiful bombshell of a woman with this really soft-spoken voice on trial for the vicious murders of her two young sons. The prosecution painted her as a selfish woman who didn't love her children and only cared about herself. They claimed that she was obsessed with her looks and wanted to paint a picture of a perfect life that her two little boys just didn't fit in with. Her motive? According to the prosecution, Darley was going broke and she needed more money to finance her lavish lifestyle. The Routiers had just bought a big, beautiful, brand new home and they were struggling to keep up with the payments. Her children were interfering, so they had to go, according to the prosecution. Darley's friends would take the stand and try to defend her against this character assassination. They said that she was very loving and kind, a very attentive mother who enjoyed spending time with her three boys. Her husband, Darren, also defended her on the stand. As a side note, can I just ask why the hell he wasn't looked at for the murder? He has just as much motive and opportunity as Darley did. This exact same thing has happened in several other cases that I've covered where a mother is accused of murdering her kids and is assumed guilty, while the father, who also lives at the home, is never looked at. It's strange. But anyway, yes, she was struggling with depression and had her bad days, as everyone else has, but she definitely did not want to kill her children, according to the defense team. Besides, she had three boys. If she was truly sick of being a mother, wouldn't she have killed all three boys? They also argued that the timeline didn't make much sense for the theory that Darley would have staged the crime scene. Once Devin had been stabbed, he would have had only seven or maybe eight minutes to live before he succumbed to his injuries. According to the 911 call recording, Devin was still alive when Darley was on the phone with 911. She wouldn't have had enough time to stage the crime scene after killing the boys, particularly with the bloody sock. As for Darley's wounds, which the prosecution claimed were superficial and self-inflicted, a medical examiner called in by the defense team claimed that the knife had actually come within two millimeters of a major artery and it would have killed her if it was nicked. 
He said this was no superficial wound at all. It could have been fatal. Darley also had very severe bruising on her arms that didn't appear to be self-inflicted. The jury didn't buy it. And on February 1st, Darley Routier would be found guilty of murdering her son, Damon. It came with a death sentence. She currently sits on death row at the Mountain View unit in Gatesville, Texas. It's the very same prison as Taylor Parker. This is where all convicted women in Texas go to await their death date. Now, as of today, Darley still claims she is innocent and had nothing to do with the murders of her sons, Devin and Damon. Her husband, Darren, backs her up, even though the couple has divorced several years ago. He still publicly says that he believes Darley is innocent. And there are many others as well who believe that Darley was unfairly targeted from the beginning, mostly because of her looks, because she has the fake boobs and the fake hair, the big house and the nice car. Her support team says that the police created this superficial version of Darley that just doesn't exist. Whether or not Darley was selfish, conceited, or whatever, does not automatically make her a murderer, which is exactly what her new legal team is trying to show. They've worked on several appeals for her, all of which have been denied so far. The state of Texas had even offered to commute Darley's death sentence for a life sentence if she were to just admit to killing her babies, but she refused to take the deal. Now, the focus is to prove that there really was an intruder that fateful night. They've done this by petitioning to have some of the evidence further analyzed, like that unknown fingerprint that was found on the windows. It didn't match anyone who lived at the home at the time, and it's said to be an adult fingerprint, not a child's. There is also a very plausible theory involving Darley's husband, Darren. As I mentioned previously, the couple was having some pretty serious financial issues. They were on the brink of bankruptcy, and their whole world was beginning to crumble. It wasn't known at the time of the attack, but Darren had actually taken out a life insurance policy on Darley, and this all happened shortly before the murders. It's now alleged he may have hired someone to break into the family home and kill Darley for the life insurance policy. Maybe the two boys were just an unintended victim. And it's not so far-fetched. He had a past with insurance fraud. Darren had asked an acquaintance in the past to steal his Jaguar, as well as to steal various expensive items from his home, because he wanted to commit insurance fraud. He could have easily asked someone to kill his wife for the insurance. As it stands now, the Innocence Project has stepped in to help Darley with her case. They are going to be paying to have further testing of the bloody sock that was found, as well as the fingerprints on the windowsill. Once the results come back, it could provide further cause to either appeal or retry her case altogether. This is another one that I'm going to be watching closely. It's been really satisfying seeing all of those cold cases and unsolved cases and possibly wrong convictions being looked at again because technology has finally caught up. I'll keep you all posted. And now I pass the question over to you. After hearing the facts of this case, Do you think that Darlie killed her two children, or do you think that she's innocent? Do you believe that she at least deserves a new trial, or is she right where she should be? Let me know your thoughts. That's it for me tonight. If you want to reach out, you can find me on Facebook at Serial Napper. You can also search for me on Apple or Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Check me out on Twitter at Serial underscore Napper. Or I'm on YouTube, and if you're watching on YouTube, I'd love if you can give me a thumbs up and subscribe. Until next time, stay safe, stay kind, especially in the comments. Bye.